Welcome back to Catalan Soccer guys, I'm Catalan Ben and today we're bringing you a brand new video that's 10 coaching tips you need to know to improve your coaching. Let's run that intro. Today's video guys is sponsored by Oglove, so we will be telling you all about the Oglove later on in the video, but let's get straight into tip number one for tips that you need to improve your coaching. So tip number one guys is to watch and read body language. So you need to be an expert in reading the body language of your players so that during your training you can tell when they're motivated, when their motivation's dropped, when they're bored, and when you need to change the game and change an activity to keep them engaged. Key things to look out for in body language are slumped shoulders, kids running around with their head down, just a lethargic nature where as you're doing any kind of drill or ball mastery, the kids are doing it at a slow pace and seem disinterested. As soon as you read that in their body language, change things up, bring them in and give them something different to work on. Kids will often show you that they are bored before they will tell you that they are bored. So keep your eye out for that body language and keep changing your practice to keep kids focused. Tip number two is short and sweet. So I like to try and keep my messages as short as possible and I usually find that a three word phrase or three individual words that the kids can repeat back to me, can make sure they focus on and can remember is the best way to set my expectations for the session. If you make things too difficult to either rehearse or remember and kids are not gonna be able to remember that, they're not gonna be able to bring it into their next training session or their next game. So keep things short and sweet Think of things that might sound like a catchphrase or that have alliteration and use those kind of tactics to keep your messages memorable, short and punchy. And as an extra tip, make sure that kids are repeating your messages back to you as you move the practice on. So if you've just explained something and you're making sure that kids then understand it, you're making sure they say it back to you, you know that they have a comprehensive understanding of what the expectations are and what they need to do next. So get them to repeat it back to you to make sure they've soaked it up. Tip number three is to keep it realistic. So make sure that your practices as often as you can has some sort of opposition or pressure for the players whilst they're playing. It might be that if you're working with beginner to intermediate players, then they're not ready for full defenders and tons of pressure as they're trying to learn new techniques. But once you've got past the stage where kids have developed a little bit of understanding, they've developed some ability with the ball, then try and bring in some form of pressure as early as possible. I like to use dribbling defenders in my practices because this gives an opposition to the attacker, make sure that when they're playing there is opposition that they have to consider, they have to try and dodge and get around. But because that defender is dribbling a ball, it handicaps that defender, means that they can't easily just take the ball away from the attackers and gives everybody a more realistic chance of beating someone to score or taking the ball away from an attacker. But we're not making things too difficult too soon. We're full on defenders pressurizing the ball and running straight at a player who's trying to find their feet is always going to make things too difficult too quick. Now, if you're working with intermediate to advanced players, then unless they are working on a very specific technique, I would always recommend trying to make it in a post practice where there are either time constraints or pressure constraints from defenders, or ideally both. This is the kind of thing that is more relevant in a game that they will come up against. And I often find that kids who don't perform in matches, but do perform in training, that's usually because in training they are unopposed, they are doing it under a very low pressure, and then when they come into matches and the pressure increases, the time constraints reduce, it gets a lot more difficult and kids can't cope in that environment. So try and recreate that environment in your sessions, keep it realistic and keep them under pressure. Tip number four is find the fun. There is fun in any drill or any activity that you plan, but sometimes coaches will get caught up in the message that they're trying to get across in a particular technique, in a particular pattern that they're trying to make work, and then suddenly they forget that they are coaching young children, a game that they love, which should always be fun. So make sure in any practice that you are trying to plan or devise, or an idea that you've seen elsewhere that you really like and you're going to borrow and try and introduce that with your kids make sure that you are trying to bring out the fun factor make it a game make it team related make it in some way relate to a fun game that kids like to play 
For example, I run a really simple drill with some of my youngest kids where they're trying to navigate with the ball and dribble through an area. And as they're doing that, we play a what time is it Mr. Wolf style game. So they have to keep the ball under control and close to their feet. If at any point the coach turns round, then they have to be able to stop their ball quickly and balance up with their foot on their ball. So although it's dribbling, although it's just a locomotion drill where kids are just trying to move and move in a linear direction with a slight variation of touches, we're still making it a fun drill because kids have got a little bit of nerves about them. They're a little bit worried they might get caught, they might get out, and they might manage to win the game. So by making it a game and making it more fun, we're doing a very typical dribbling style drill, but we're keeping it fun and keeping it as exciting as possible for those youngest kids. Now, we're just going to pause the video very briefly, guys, to talk about today's sponsor. Now, I know that most people click off when you see a sponsor and skip through to the next part of the video. I warn you that if you do that, you are going to miss out on something that you will find extremely useful if you're a football coach. These gloves designed by Oglove are waterproof. They are extremely warm. They're comfortable and they're touchscreen compatible as well. So they're an excellent product that will fit into your coaching bag. I promise you guys, I was skeptical about any gloves that were actually waterproof. I tried Nike, I tried North Face, I tried Adidas, I tried ones that cost me as much as £35 for repair, and every single one of them had the same problem. They were slightly waterproof in the damp. As soon as it got really, really wet, I still got wet anyway, my hands still ended up being cold. I ended up having to take off the expensive gloves that I bought because actually they were keeping my hands colder because they were saturated and they didn't keep me dry. And once they were wet, the touchscreen capability was pointless. I couldn't then use my phone either. But the O glove we've tested under extreme conditions. I've literally poured these under the tap and the waterproof factor on them is excellent. They're extremely water resistant. They are touchscreen compatible and they keep your hands warm even in the coldest weather. And don't just take my word for it. These guys have got nearly a thousand positive reviews on Amazon. Before I buy anything, I always check on sites like Amazon to make sure that they've got a good five-star review. And these guys have got nearly a thousand of them. So you know that it's a high quality product. Don't just take my word for it. They are an excellent product that's well manufactured and that's cheap and affordable. Now, not only are they already a great price, but you can get 10% off by using the code CATALAN10 if you purchase from the Oglove website. So when I ask for a promo code, just fill in CATALAN10. And as a subscriber to this channel, if you use that code, you will get 10% off on your pair. I promise you guys, you won't regret it. They're the best gloves that I've ever worn, and I wear them all the time now. And with a pretty cold and dark winter ahead of us, I know that they're gonna be in my boot bag every single session. So check them out, guys. If you haven't done already, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Now let's get straight back into the video. Tip number six starts with a question. Have you ever waited for the kettle to boil? I mean, stood at the side of it and actually waited from start to finish for it to finish boiling. If you've ever done that, it feels like forever. It's probably only two or three minutes, but when you're waiting for something, it takes a long, long time. Now imagine if you're a seven-year-old kid and you've just been playing a match and you're having fun and you're enjoying it and the coach stops the match for two or three or four or five minutes to talk. Now regardless of how important you think your message is, regardless of how vital that message might be for the game or for the kids as they continue to play, you are not going to keep the kids concentrating and listening to your message for two or three or four or five minutes. So keep your messages short and sweet. Imagine you stood by the kettle waiting two or three minutes, looking at your watch thinking, God, can this take much longer? Well, imagine being that seven-year-old. You're dying to get back into the game. You can't believe it was even stopped. You want to keep playing, and the coach then talks and talks and talks and talks. So keep your messages short and sharp. Give yourself a 30-second, a 45-second, a 60-second time limit. Try and get through your message nice and quick. And if you feel when you're looking across that crowd of faces that they're not listening, that they've switched off, that they're not taking the messages in from you then stop talking get back into the game and accept that you can't always get every single message you want to the kids in every single team talk so sometimes i will stop the kids i'll give them 30 seconds short sharp message here's what we need to improve on let's give that a go and before i start to lose them i get them back into the game and it might be that the main message i wanted to get across i don't quite get out in that team talk and i save it for one later down the line or we talk about that after the session or after the match but stopping the game and talking for three or four minutes is never ever ever going to keep kids focused so keep it short keep it sweet and remember don't go on for too long 
that was the chair, honestly. Um, tip number seven is to plan two sessions. Now I know that not all coaches write down a physical plan and that's not how everybody works. Some people just come up with it in their head, some people will do it on a notepad and piece of paper, some people want to do it on iPads, some people watch a video, but whatever it is, your method for planning your session, don't just plan one. If you plan one session, and you're planning for the maximum number of kids, so say for instance you're working with a group of 14 kids, you plan for 14, you're planning the perfect session, so you're planning what your timings will be, when your cues might go down, how long kids will be waiting before they do the next part of the drill, and all those things that you're trying to plan with one particular number of kids is then completely unraveled if you either get more or less than that perfect number. So I always plan two sessions. I plan for my maximum number of kids, so if I'm planning my session, I plan for 14, and then I always have a plan for between four and seven kids. Now what that allows me to do is if I get a low attendance or I get illnesses, I get injuries, especially with COVID isolations over the past 12 months, I'm sure you've had a lot of sessions where you've not had your full complement of players available, but you might have seen a session online and thought, oh, I'll do that, but it was designed for 12 to 15 kids. Then when you've got six, it doesn't work. So try and plan a second session, one that can be chopped in half, is a bit more of a bite-sized activity, and kids can do in a smaller group, or maybe just do one station instead of doing two or three or four. And then you won't get caught out by the smaller numbers. If you get that middle range where you get sort of a 10, 11, 12 kids, then you might still be able to make your 14 kid session work, or it might be that you run a very similar version of your smaller session, just with a little bit longer cues or a few more kids on the ball but try and plan two sessions so you don't get caught out, especially over the winter months when weather can get poor, when kids won't be at training quite as often. Don't get caught out by planning a big session for lots of kids and then suddenly four or five kids turn up and you've got nothing planned. So give yourself two plans every time. Tip number eight is to make matches more than just games. So when my kids are playing in matches, I try to give them different scenarios to try and achieve, different objectives, different ways that they can either try and score or earn bonus goals, and try and make things a little bit different from a typical run of the mill, one team versus another team, everybody just tries to score. By giving constraints in the game and by giving little objectives for teams or for individuals, you can make the kids problem solve better, their decision making can be stressed, and you can put them through tests that normal matches might not give them or might not give them often enough for how you're trying to push your players. Say for instance you've got particular kids in your team that don't travel very well with the ball and they don't move with it, they often just kick it first or second time and give it to another teammate. If you're wanting to develop that in kids, then doing that in training isn't the only way to do it. You need to be able to do it in matches as well. So what you need to do in that kind of circumstance is to give those individual players constraints where they might only be able to release the ball after they've had it for four seconds. So when they get the ball, they have to keep it, they have to move, they have to drive forward with the ball, and then they can play a pass. It might be that you actually take all passes off a player. I sometimes turn my kids into a mini Messi and when they get the ball in the opponent's half they're not allowed to pass. Now when they're not allowed to pass they have to dribble, they have to shoot to release the ball, they have to be a bit more brave and a bit more creative. I don't do this for a very long period, I make sure it mixes up across the teams and I make sure that the kids who are already very good at dribbling and passing probably aren't going to do that that much, but the kids who are a little bit more fearful to take control of the ball and to really run with the ball, I make sure that they get a few minutes in every game where they have to do it and they have to push themselves to try. And when they do that, they surprise themselves with where their limits actually are. They might find that they score goals, that they create chances, that they hit shots that they never normally would. And it's because a normal game wouldn't allow them to do that because they would always just give the ball to someone else. But because I've put a constraint on the game and given an objective in a match, it then makes sure that those kids are pushing themselves and dealing with a bravery on the ball that they don't usually do. Tip number nine is to rehearse patterns. Now, patterns are very important, and in a game that is very fluid and moves around a lot and players are all in different positions, it's not easy to recreate a pattern exactly as you practiced it in training, but that doesn't mean there isn't a lot to be taken from trying to put these into practice and rehearse these patterns to give good decision making, good timing, to execute runs, to know when to play the passes. And by rehearsing these little patterns, whether it's playing out from the back, whether it's an indirect free kick scenario, whether it's a throwing routine or a short corner routine, by playing these little patterns and rehearsing them in training, you'll find them a lot more effective in a game. 
Now there's always going to be a time when you try to execute a rehearsed pattern and something's different because a defender goes into a different position to what you've practiced it or something like that that then messes up the pattern. That's okay, that's part of problem solving and decision making for kids. But by developing these patterns, you help them speed up their decision making process, you make them move the ball a little bit quicker because things are a little bit more rehearsed. And then once kids are very rehearsed with their patterns, you can start to throw in some adjustments or tweaks or a few curve balls that might not be in the normal rehearsal pattern to try and catch them out and then you can really push decision making but it's a very good way to start building decision making is to build patterns first once we understand the pattern of play and we understand where the ball goes and when then we can bring decision making into it I find this a very good way of teaching playing out from the back I do it in rehearsed patterns of set plays of where the ball's going to go when it goes there which player it goes to when triggers happen as the ball arrives at a certain player where another player goes once we've got those patterns down and nailed unopposed then we try and put some decision making in playing the same patterns but then deciding does it go right or does it go left does it go forward does it go sideways based on where the defender comes so get the patterns right first then bring the decisions and tip number 10 is to not be too stubborn. This isn't a tip for the kids it's a tip for you as coaches. There's a lot of ways that I used to be stubborn as a coach I'm not ashamed to admit that when I was younger, I thought that the experience that I'd gained was enough that I could then just carry on teaching kids in one particular way and my style worked for me, so that was fine. I didn't watch loads of videos, I didn't read loads of books, I wasn't listening to other coaches' ideas because I thought, oh, that's not the way that I do it, so why would I want to know that? What you have to do as a coach is not be stubborn. There's a lot of great coaches out there, coaches that will give you free advice, coaches where you can borrow ideas from, coaches who have much more experience than you either do right now or maybe than you ever will. And what you can't do as a coach is be too stubborn and think that just because the way that you do things seems to work quite well for you, that you can't grow and learn as a coach so try and absorb try and download as much information as you can into your brain that will help you coach in different scenarios the second way to not be stubborn is don't be stubborn to a practice that isn't working if you've planned something and you think it's going to work great you might have got the kids on a bad day it might be bad weather they might be tired after school they might have just been on half term they might all be a bit silly when you're working with children even when you're working with adults people have bad days and bad days at the office so what you need to make sure you do is have a plan in your head try your best to make it work but then don't be married to that idea if it isn't working be prepared to tear it up try something new put them into games earlier but don't drag kids or drag players through a session that isn't working just because you had the idea don't be stubborn don't get stuck in the mud keep being flexible as much as you can in your coaching we hope you found those 10 great tips useful for your coaching. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't done already, guys. And if you like this kind of content, then we've got lots more for it. Check out our other videos and keep it out for our next ones too. Thanks a lot, guys. I will see you very soon.